Uh, that's Tony Lovato from Mest. Hi. Returning to Carquin Carney. Oh, right there. It's, it's that it tower is. thing. Okay. It's that big phallic thing. Uh, it is Carquin Carney, sponsored tonight by CNH Financial Services. See how we do this on the fly? Yeah. CNH Financial fun. Services, business owners. Are you tired of your hard-earned profits going toward paying expensive fees every time your customer pays with a credit or debit card? We are, I'm out of breath. I'm like winded from reaching in the backseat. This is embarrassing, Tony. Uh, we're happy to announce that our partners at CNH Financial Services have the solution. CNH is the fastest growing financial services company in Illinois, as recognized by Inc. Magazine. And their patented technology allows you to eliminate 100% of the fees associated with accepting credit and debit cards as a form of payment. That's right, Tony Lovato of the band Mast, 100% of the fees. CNH will also upgrade your business to the industry's leading point of sale system to streamline every aspect of your business for no cost. That's right. Tony, yes. no cost. Visit freeprocessingnow.com or call 855-600-2437, extension 999, and start saving money today. It's car con carne. Let's eat in the car. It's car con carne. Uh, someone just messaged as we're recording this on Facebook Live. Hope your car is warm. It's cold outside. Oh, my God, it's so cold as we're doing this. <laughs> it's the dead of January. Uh, Mast has a new album. It is Masquerade. Uh, you previewed it. We're here in the Insanity Factory, or outside the Insanity Factory, run by the fine folks at 350 Brewing, one of my favorite places in the southwest. Sur I'll Thank just you. say my favorite place in the southwest suburbs. Absolutely. It, the food's great. The beer's great. He's, love done this a, he's, he's done a great job with really bringing the music community together with the oh, yeah. shit. Like, it's, it's, it's awesome. Uh, so, tonight, we're going to hear some new stuff, right? Yes. But to get there, we need to jump the hurdle of an album you put out 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Now, I knew you back then. Yes, you did. The album was Wasting Time. Yes, it was. 20 years is a long time. It's a very long time. Now, I know that that, re that was... That represent that spoke to you. That was an album that truly represented Mest in 2000. Are you the same person you were back then? I don't. I mean, is anybody the same person they were 20 years ago? I'm sure I hope not. not. Yeah. Um, I mean, in a way, it, but also, you know, you become an adult. I have a five-year-old kid, and you know, you uh, who appears uh, on Masquerade. Yes, he does. Actually, yes, he does. Um, but I mean, it's always that same thing too, where. Um, this sounds really weird, but I was. Everybody has a fear of growing up, and like as you're getting older, you're like, "Fuck, I don't want another birthday." And one thing that well, rock and roll is <clears throat> the ultimate Peter Pan life. It is, and that's what. When I finally realized, as dumb as it sounds, that I'm not the only one getting older, and that everybody is getting older, is when I was sort of like, "Oh, okay, it's not that big of a deal. We're uh -huh. all doing this together." Um, but I forget that I'm as old as I am. I'm 39, and like we were in the airport at 6 a.m. to come out here to do the show. Business guy, full on suit, fucking everything, walks by us and sort of like does like a double take. And I was like, that was a fucking weird look. So we're just sitting there for a little bit longer. Then the bar opened up at six. So we started to walk over to the bar. He comes rushing up to me, hey man, can I, can I get a photo with you? And in my brain, I was like, this guy's so old. How is he? And I'm like, no, he's not. He's my age. <laughs> right. But you forget that these people are, you know what I mean? It's just because you're, you, like you said, it's a Peter Pan thing. Like, you know, I'm still playing shows and hanging out with my friends and currently have a hangover. So it, you know, it feels like, you know, a 20 year old. So if you're watching this on Facebook Live as this is happening live, uh, tonight in Tinley Park, Mest performing live on stage, performing an album released 20 years ago today, this year, all the way through in its entirety. I love album plays. Yeah. Do you remember how to play all the songs? No. <laughs> no. Um, we're going to get by. I already told everybody we're going to do our best. It's going to be a subpar show. No, we'll be fine. The hardest thing is like not fucking up lyrics because. If I start to think about it, that's when... You get in your head? Yeah. So I just have to go through the motions and let, let it just happen. But if you fuck up, I mean, it's punk rock, right? Absolutely. I mean, this isn't a King Crimson concert. You're allowed to make mistakes. And that's when maybe the, I'll probably say more this show than ever. All right, let me hear you sing it. <laughs> That'll be just me not knowing the fucking words. So but. if you're playing the whole album in its entirety, does that include the unbilled nope. bonus track? Uh, oh, Fuck the Ground Bus? Uh-huh. Yes. It would have to, right? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. It's a mess classic. It is. Actually, that was like, I mean, we wrote that song just sort of as a chitty sort of punk rock ending anthem style. It was actually about our first trip 
uh, we took a Greyhound out to California to play a show with Goldfinger. And we had to take a Greyhound because we didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. And it was just, fought. by the time I got to California, I was already calling my old man going, hey, I definitely need to fly home. I'm not taking this back home. So it's a And very, this is before Megabus even existed. Oh, it's Megabus. It, it's like Greyhound, but worse. Oh, wow. Yeah. Can you get worse? Okay. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, it's always become an anthem. Fans love it. You know, we used to end our set with it back in the day. So definitely will be played tonight. Uh, drawing board did I hear you I was, I was listening to some of your sound checked I feel like you were teasing drawing board but you didn't play it as you were sound checking I was setting my clean channel to my destruction channel so I was but that was that was the opening guitar wasn't it yeah okay yeah, yeah. we will obviously we're playing that tonight too hotel room I mean these are these are quintessential messed songs yeah Dilio. is it nice to get that one out of the way early yeah, we'll see are, are you not doing it in sequence we'll see <laughs> so yeah, I just assumed you were doing like in order. There's, uh, this is what we did. On the list, it says Mess is playing Wasting Time in its entirety. Uh huh. With, uh, with surprises. Okay. So and you're you're gonna after um, Wasting Time, or at some point you're still gonna bust out the mess. I mean, people will hear Jaded and Cadillac and. Yeah, we're going to. Um, we're playing a fucking long set, longest set we've ever played. We're playing the 15 songs. Walking off stage, waiting the crowd to cheer to fill our egos, and then going back up on stage and playing another twelve songs. <laughs> That's awesome. It's gonna be fucking rough. And this space is really cool. Yeah, it, it's this warehouse space. It almost feels like it shouldn't be here. It's in this industrial park. So you, you go off the main road, you make a couple turns, you're in this industrial area, and then suddenly, boom! There's a, a punk rock venue with giant beer tanks. You, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't even know from the outside either. No, until you go inside, and then it's like, okay, this exists. Yeah. I, I think this is what rave kids experience. Absolutely. Except this is punk rock. Except for we won't be on that many drugs. No, nary a glow stick in sight. Right. Uh, it's not wrong to say that there was a point where it seemed like you guys would never do this again. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we when we disbanded in 2006, we then didn't play another show until 10, 9 years later. Yeah. And that was just the whim of, like, I started watching... Uh, the Warp Tour DVD from 2003, and I was like, I wonder what it'd be like to be on stage with the guys, you know, like because when you have a repertoire with each other, which you know we grew up together. Matt's my cousin, you know, jo um, Jeremiah who plays guitar in the band. His younger brother Josh is one of my best friends, so it was very much just four kids hanging out. It wasn't like a Craigslist, hey, I want to fucking be in a band, Let's right? Join. It was just us hanging out, um, and so. Watching those videos sort of reminded me, like, we just, we could get, we would, before tours, when we were touring consistently, w there were some tours we never even, we didn't rehearse. We would just write a set list, the first three shows were rehearsal to get shit tight again. But it was because we played together so much. We yeah. know, you know what I mean? Like, it's easy to, to know what each other's gonna do. Yeah, you can compensate for the other one. If someone fucks up, you can kind of back Absolutely. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then I just, um, after watching that, I, randomly hit up Matt and was like, what would you think about fucking playing a show together? And he was like, well, he's like, you hit up Nick, I'll hit up Jer. And then they both were like, yeah, let's do it. So, and everybody's getting along? Everybody gets along now, It's still yeah. fun? Still fun. Um, it's, you know what I mean? Like, everybody gets older and you just sort of forget about the bag. It was just, we were, people don't realize when we broke up, we had already been a band for 12 years. Yeah. We put out... I think 98 was when I first heard you, right? Yeah. That yeah, was the no, first maybe, album. Yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, that was the uh, Mo Money More 40s. Yeah. I remember we were doing a show for Q101. It was like one of the like local shows or something. Where, like um, the New Music Tuesday yeah, or whatever that and was. and I think yeah. it was maybe even us and Show Off doing it together. And Sounds I made right. this flyer of these three old men. I don't know if you remember this. I don't. But, but it was three old men uh, going down on each other. And <laughs> that was the flyer I was handing out in front of the Metro. And then <laughs> you got word, and I remember you came out, and you were Me? like, hey, yeah, yeah. And because they obviously started getting around, and <laughs> you were like, hey, I think uh, you're going to have to not pass those out anymore. And I was like, all right, man. So, because what we did was we put a band name on top of each old uh -huh. man, and so we censored them. Because they weren't censored at first. It was straight up just uh -huh. three old dudes blowing each other. And I, can't really. I could see where that may have run in conflict Absolutely. or run afoul of the radio station. I, uh, yeah, especially because our fans were like, you know, Anywhere from 14 yeah. to... We were yeah. Really thinking, we were still young, too, so... It's interesting. You, you mentioned Show Off, and thinking about those early days, I interviewed you, this was a long time ago, uh, describing that era and coming together, because there was something in the water in the suburbs back then. 
you wrote, I hear of bands doing like performances for tons of different labels, doing showcases and all this shit. And it's like the hardest thing for them. For us, Mast, we sent the demo to somebody. They were like, yeah. And then we got signed to a major label. It's like a fucking fake story. Yeah. That, that is. Yeah. And but, it, but what you don't see in hearing that is all the flyering and the. Right. I mean, I still hustled like a motherfucker when I was a kid, you know, like I would go to every show, hand out CDs, bother yeah. the band members, start crowd surfing so I could fucking hawk CDs on stage. You know, I threw, I can't tell you how many bands I threw CDs at less than Jake, Blink-182, the fucking Beastie Boys. Like it was just a way of like, I want somebody to hear this yeah. record, you know? Um, and, but, you know, we did work a lot, but the way we got signed was just one of those one in a million fucking stories. Right. You know, like, yeah, I, I, I'm glad that it was that fucking easy because... <laughs> well, as you're reliving Wasting Time tonight, I mean, here you are, you've got Masquerade, you just released this new album. How different is it when you guys come together to record music now as opposed to 2000? It seems like the pressure would be off in the present day. It is. It, it definitely is. Um, the process was a lot different because I live in California. Matt and Jer live here, um, and then Nick lives in Detroit. Um, you chose a great time to come back to Chicago. Always. We always <laughs> fuck up, man. Never again. I talked to my cousin about it. I'm like, we had to do this one because of the record coming uh -huh. out. That's it. Never again. Um, we'll come back, but not uh, during these fucking... During January. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was a lot different, though, now because I technically started writing this record about... Four, four or five years ago, I'm a son You sent me some demos. I want to say like two years ago. Yeah, from and this. that I yeah, probably sent you fucking Masquerade too. Yeah. Um, but when I was writing that, I had a concept of doing a side project called London Falling. Had a bunch of members. At one point, it was like I was talking to Cone from Some Forty One. Then Paul from Good Charlie was going to play bass. Um, uh, what's his name? Drummer of uh, Yellow Card LP. He was going to play drums. Like all these different members, people were talking, doing this. So I just started writing songs and I was telling fans, you know, this would be what, if Mass were to do a record again, this was just a continuation of it. Mm -hmm. But considering you guys can't really tour that much, I'm like, I should just move on and just fucking. And then it got to the point where I started writing so many songs where I just, in my head, I said, you know what? Whatever I decide to do with this music, I'll, I'll, when I get there, I'll figure that out. But mm -hmm. I'm just going to write songs for now. So, you know, my kid was first born, and so I spent a lot of time at home and in the studio with him. And it just got to the point where one of the guys that was playing with me was like, why don't you put this, like, these are mess songs. Like, this should come out as messed. And I was just like, and he said that to me. There's a buddy of mine who was actually playing bass in London Falling. And it just clicked, and I was like, this is a messed record. Like, I have to mm -hmm. put this out. So I hit up the guys, and we'd already been playing a couple shows, you know, here and there, doing our annual come to Chicago during the cold weather and put our fans in danger shows <laughs> and um, I just started sending them demos but like I play drums and so I did a lot of the pre-production and the writing at my house and sort of sent it to the guys and said okay here's the structure and I've been I've, we've done so many records together that I know how to fucking produce a song at yeah. this point in my life I know how to trim off the fat and make you know if this part doesn't go whatever um, and I spent so much time on it that I just sent the songs to the guys and I said here you go learn some parts and, um, you know, it was like they came out and put, like, you know, if Matt wanted to change a bass line, shit like that, I was like, go for it. Like, um, and then with, like, drum fills, it was, I mean, Nick did this, me and Nick did this back in the day, too, where we lived together and we would write structured parts together and I would always have drum ideas. And he, if it sounded good, he was like, cool, it sounds great. Why am I going to fucking right. change it? Um, but, yeah, I mean, I was in the studio for a total of probably about two months with Cameron Webb. And then the guys just literally flew out for a weekend each and did their fucking got through their parts that's and, awesome yeah uh, and we mentioned your son Don't Worry Son was the song I was referring to yes starts out as kind of a just a not kind of it starts out as a ballad then it gradually builds it's a really beautiful song thank you it, I mean certainly when I think back to since Wasting Time is yeah. top of mind think back to the album cover with um, what, smaller what's the, yeah what's the politically correct um I, uh, I don't know smaller the smaller, smaller people, smaller kin, yeah. smaller folk. Smaller. I don't know. Little people. Yeah. Is that? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but I think th this is certainly a more emotionally mature. Absolutely. Tony Lovato. Yeah. And, and Mast. I mean, when you're, you know, when you have a kid, it changes. I've always been. I think as a musician, we're naturally more emotional people mm -hmm. in a way. Um, so, I mean, I remember writing the song. I sort of wrote this piano part. And I had this melody, and I came up sort of with the chorus first of the Don't Worry Son, because life has just begun. I'm like, fuck, that's a good line. And then I was like, okay, I need inspiration. So I literally brought him into, <clears throat> into my studio and put him in his little 
bouncy thing and just stared at him and let the music play over and over again and started writing the lyrics. And it's a true story. I did tell my dad uh, on Christmas Day, he was the last one that I told that I was going to be a dad because I knew by telling him for some reason that was when it was like real. Yeah, I get that. And like, I even get emotional right now talking about it. It was like, uh, <clears throat> it was a super, super scary time for me. And because I was like, I was at the stage in my life where I thought maybe I'm not going to be a dad. Like, I was mm -hmm. like, I'm just, this is fine. I'm the cool uncle. I love kids. I love all the kids around me. My friends got kids. And then it just fucking happened. And I remember telling my dad on Christmas Day, and he's talking to me, and he's like, why do you have so much hesit hesitancy in your voice? And I'm like, I don't know. I guess I'm just sort of scared. And then he, you know, was like, you know, you, don't worry. Like, he's not going to change your life. He's going to add to your life. Yep. And he's like, you're a good person. You don't have to do anything different. He goes, when you and your brother were born, he goes, there's some shit that I had to stop fucking doing because it wasn't good for me. It wasn't good, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's like, you're good. He's like, don't worry, you know? And like, it was sort of him like passing on the torch of like, okay, now it's your turn, you know? And so, and then when I was, I happened to be doing some extra vocal things in my kitchen, because nowadays you can do any shit. I was like writing some right. piano parts for the record. Hey, you could do radio shows in your car at this Ab point. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> obviously. Um, and so I was sitting at my kitchen table with headphones on, just writing some string parts for a song, sending it over to Cameron. And my son comes up to me and he taps me on his shoulder and I go, I took the headphones off and I go, what? He goes, I love you, daddy. And I was like, wait, hold on, say that again. <laughs> and I got nice. it and sent it to Cameron and it just fits perfect on the song. It, it, it fits perfect. And another song, it, it kind of, on, you've always had a pop sensibility. You've always written big melodies. Mm -hmm. uh, These Streets sounds very much like, I mean, this isn't a pop punk song it's, it's just it's a pop song absolutely um i wrote it a long time ago and it definitely had more like of a rockish feel to it uh I, but i felt like that was a forced thing we were doing like oh we have to we have to make this rock it's a, we're a rock band mm -hmm. and then i was like this song is what it is i need to let it be what it is and the guys were very hesitant to put it on the record because it's very different sounding mm -hmm. but we always have one or two songs on each record that are different sounding than the rest of the record and Cameron was like, this is the most important song on the record to me. He goes, it's what makes you guys different than all the other pop punk bands that you can do this type of shit yeah. too. And um, it's a f true story. Um, like the whole thing, I'm not rapping in the beginning. People are like, I never thought I'd hear you rap. I'm like, I'm, I'm narrating, but you have to do it on time so it doesn't sound yeah. like shit. And I'm like, unfortunately now it sounds like I'm trying to rap and I'm like, I'm not. I'm, every kid that's in that I'm talking about in that thing is, it's a true story. Aaron's here tonight, you know, like one of my guy, one of my friends I grew up with passed away a couple of years ago and like, um, it's just about my neighborhood and um, your neighborhood in Blue Island yeah and you know because my dad grew up in the same block I did he grew up in a house across the street so like that was our you know we held down that neighborhood for 70 years and yeah. shit like that um, but to me it's more like a new modern version of like a Genesis song yeah I could hear that and I fucking I love Genesis I, mean, I grew up my dad grew up with that shit so I was like, let's just put it on the record. I'm like, it is what it is. It's an honest, true fucking story. Like, I mean, not every song has to sound the fucking... I mean, we've never been that band anyway, so... But, but, you have to keep it interesting for you. And if you're interested right. and you're engaged, you're creating art you believe in, the fans will come along. Right, yeah. And, you know, we, like, honestly, and I feel like the internet is, is made for people to complain. Like, that's sure. what it is. That's why Yelp was created. <laughs> um, and I haven't heard, like, one negative, semi-negative thing, or, oh, it's good, but I like this record. Like, it's been the most positive, like, uplifting feedback I ever could have imagined where people are like, fuck, like, if you were going to come out with a record 14 years later, this... You've always had a voice. I, I feel like you've found your voice now. Absolutely. I, I think I learned how to sing. Mm -hmm. I found out, I realized I wasn't from And England. there's a certain level of confidence you have to have. And, and yeah. And that comes with years of writing and performing. And, and you, the other thing, too, is being on the road, you have to, you have, like, unfortunately, I still smoke every once in a while, and we drink a lot on the road. In fact, you did both of those right before walking in the yeah, car. Yeah, absolutely, yep. Um, <laughs> and my New Year's resolution was to quit smoking, so obviously I'm fucking, you know, hitting, hitting that good. <laughs> um, but no, you learn how to sing because if you are singing properly, you don't lose your voice. Mm -hmm. And then once you learn how to sing properly, you learn how to hold notes better and hit, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's a natural thing. And, and from, I have a lot of friends that are fucking way better singers than me, so I just pay attention to what they're doing, and I'm like, okay, this is, this is how you sing. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I, I finally realized I'm not from London. So the English accent has disappeared. <laughs> uh, but for people who are looking for that kind of the English classic, accent, <laughs> uh, no, well, no, for, for that textbook messed on. I mean, it, it all starts with the title track. That's I believe that we did that. 
this I think it's our best record but it sounds like messed but mm-hmm. it sounds better than it sounds like a mess whose lead singer is now 39 right, right. as opposed to Right. Like, did I really meet you when you were a teenager? I'm Absolutely. I, I was like fucking 17 when I started hassling you guys in Q101. And, you know, I mean, the band started in 95, so I was 15. Yeah. So that's we started. Oh God, that's crazy. Yeah. So I was like maybe 16. Yeah. It's been a long time. All right. I'm going to let you get in and get ready for your show. We are in Tinley Park. If you're, again, if you're watching this on Facebook Live, it's a really cool space. It's a warehouse space. It's the Insanity Factory. It's awesome. Uh, 350s here. Uh, you've got uh, who's opening for you tonight? Um, Till morning. Till morning, which is if you're familiar, if you're familiar with the band Parker, this is what they evolved into. Right. Uh, Mickey from Blood Peoples, now their drummer. Great sounding band. Yeah, yeah, they're really good. Um, and then Nightcap, who is just friends of ours from the neighborhood, another Southside punk rock band. Nice. So it's a great night of music, uh, beer, loud punk rock, the return of Mast in the brutal cold. Tony, great to see you. Good to see you, too. Uh, Masquerade's the new album. It's awesome. Thank you. Well done. Appreciate uh, it. See them tonight. Support them. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, Carco and Carney sponsored this week by CNH Financial Services. And there you go. Anything else? Are we good? Uh, no, go check out the record. That's go it. Ch- that's it. There's your bottom line. Yep.